Welcome to the Spine Guy. I'm Dr. Brian Seeler, fellowship trained spine surgeon. The Spine Guy is a channel dedicated to making the complex spine simple for patients to understand. In our last video, we talked about what basovitibo ablation is and how it might help you avoid surgery for degenerative disc disease. Today, we'll be talking about the step-by-step -step process of how to actually do a basovitibo ablation. As a disclaimer, I'm not a paid consultant for Boston Scientific, and this video is not sponsored by Boston Scientific or basovitibo ablation. Basovitibo ablation is performed by surgeons, physiatrists, interventional radiologists, and anesthesia pain doctors. I like to introduce Dr. Ramo Naidu. He's an anesthesia pain doctor within our practice who does perform quite a bit of the relievement procedure. Because Dr. Naidu is one of the highest performers in the country of the relievement procedure, he is a paid consultant. He does teach and speak on behalf of Boston Scientific. We're going to talk to him about the procedure, exactly what happens, some of the recovery, as well as some of the risks and benefits of the basovitibo ablation. Welcome, Dr. Naidu, to the Spine Guy. Uh, Dr. Naidu performs a relievement procedure within our practice. He's an anesthesia pain doctor. So first, let's talk about the procedure itself. Talk about where this procedure happens, what kind of anesthetic is used, and talk through the exact steps that happen during this basovitibo ablation. Absolutely. So I'll start off with where we do the procedure. It's generally done in an ambulatory surgery center as an outpatient procedure. The procedure usually takes about 30 to 45 minutes and it's a come and go, meaning you, you go home that same day. Um, let's talk about the anesthesia. Anesthesia can range anywhere from little local anesthesia to a little bit of sedation, you know, like a colonoscopy to full on intubation, general anesthesia. Yeah, this procedure is more like a colonoscopy in that most people get what's called monitored anesthetic care, which is a deeper level of sedation. Sometimes if the anesthesiologist thinks it's safer, they will do a general anesthetic, which includes putting a tube down your airway. And what's the downside of tube down the airway in terms of recovery or the actual? The two downsides are one is the potential for sore throat. The other is depending on the type of anesthetic they use, the recovery afterwards may be a little bit longer. In depends. the surgery center, in not surgery days center. longer, but just Correct. they might keep you a little bit longer. For a couple hours center. rather okay. than one hour. Um, all right, let's talk through the exact steps that happen uh, for this procedure. The way we do the procedure is we are trying to ablate the basal vertebral nerve, which is inside the vertebral body. And the way we do it is we access from the back of the spine towards the front of the spine. So it goes through a bone called the pedicle, which is the bridge between the front and back of the spine. And this is the pedicle right here, this little clear part. That's correct. So if this is a, another vertebral body, this would be the pedicle that you would yes. put through. And and we can we actually can show, that right show you there. in this model how it actually enters from the back to the front. And as you can see, it's aiming towards the middle of the vertebral body. So it's going through that bone to the body. Okay. You got it. And if we're trying to ablate the nerves that are going to this one disc, we would have to ablate this vertebral body as well as this vertebral body. So after I ablate this vertebral body, I would take this out and start on the other side with the same procedure again to stop the pain coming from this one disc. Okay, so then now you're into the bone, now what happens? Okay, and once I'm into the bone, I introduce this curved little tube that goes through that specialized needle or trocar. And I'll show you here what that looks like. So as you can see, it's curving from the pedicle towards the trunk or the base of the basal vertebral nerve. So we can get to the middle of the middle of this. You got ideally. it. And then once we get that and we're watching all of this with fluoroscopy or x-ray. Right. So this is done under x-ray guidance. None of these instruments are placed without knowing exactly where you're putting them. Exactly. I'm doing this through a really small incision. So nothing is open. I'm not visualizing. I'm using the x-ray to show it all. And then once I get the probe in, as you can see here, it's right through that nerve. And then we connect it to a generator that ablates for seven to 15 minutes. And now the incisions for this. So um, if this is the back, yes. you're going to have a tiny poke hole here, a tiny poke hole there. That's right. And the incisions, you know what, like just a few millimeters, That's no right. bigger, no real bigger than this trocar. That's All right. right. Good. So now you finish the ablation. Um, you put a little stitch in that hole or what, how do you close that? We just use a little glue. Okay, a little bit of skin glue over That's it. Correct. Okay. So patients get it. They now they're obviously face down for this procedure, right? Because they have to be like that in order exactly. for you to access the pedicle. Yes. Um, we flip the patient, they go to recovery, and how long will they stay in recovery? What does that look like? Usually about thirty to sixty minutes, depending on how long the procedure was or if it was a general versus the deeper sedation. And then they go home. They go home. And what do patients expect in the first week? How much activity can they do? How much pain will they expect in that first week? 
There is some soreness from where those needles were placed in through the back that lasts a few days up to a week generally. Most people can do things around the house the next day. We advise the day of the procedure to take it easy because of the anesthesia. Uh, we don't want any falls or anything like that. But the next day, if you feel up to it, do things around the house, you can go for walks. And then what about, you know, people that go to the gym routinely, are working out routinely, running a couple miles, how long till they can do that? We advise taking off rigorous activity for two weeks just to see how things are going. If, of course, you feel really good, you feel like you want to get back to it, just work your way up. I do a lot of spine procedures, spine surgery procedures. There's always risks, there are always benefits. Um, let's talk about some of the risks of this procedure and some of the percentage of times that can happen. What are, the, what are the things that can happen with this procedure? Anytime we introduce a needle or a sharp object in anybody, we always talk about risks of bleeding, infection, or nerve injury. Bleeding and infection is extremely, extremely rare in this procedure. Nerve injury does happen, however. And why does that happen? This is the back of the spine, there's the front, these are the nerves, um, you're going through the bone, so, so how would you irritate the nerve? Yeah, we suspect that on occasion when we're trying to go through the bone, sometimes the specialized needle or trocar slips off, goes too low, goes too far to the inside, and may ding that nerve that comes from the spinal canal out down to your leg. And so some people will have this leg pain that again is temporary. What's, uh, how long can it last and is it permanent? It can or last a few months, um, but the average length of time it took was about 50 days afterwards for it to resolve. Okay, let's say you're a patient, you get this procedure, you do get a little bit of leg pain. What are, are there any treatments for that? Can you do epidurals? Can you take medication? Yes, you can have an epidural steroid injection to calm it down or some people get an oral steroid back. And what would you say is the percentage of time that this can happen? Around 5% from that study. However, in my experience, I've never seen it. Okay, so we'll try to keep it that way. Dr. and I do. <laughs> um, now let's talk about the, about the benefits. People are getting this because, you know, it's supposed to help their back pain. Um, we always like to look at clinical trials. You know, we're scientists, you're a scientist. You like to, to read the data, read the studies. Tell us in general, what can patients expect in terms of how much pain relief in their back and what are the studies uh, out there that back this up? Yeah, in interventional pain, we consider a 50% reduction in your pain or more a success. And so from the two level one studies that were industry sponsored, about 70% of individuals had at least a 50% reduction in their pain. And some of you might be asking, well, what is the percent chance that my pain will go away completely or be a remitter or a cured uh, pain? And that percentage is about 30 to 33%. And just so, just so our viewers know, that's a pretty good rate of success. Even when we talk about lumbar spinal surgery, fusions for back pain, et cetera, you know, my experience in my hands and the right patient, that's about 90%, but that's a real open surgery. 70% um, I would say is pretty good. And what are the best available studies out there that you can cite that, that, that show us that this works? So the first study was called the, the SMART study, which was a randomized trial comparing the procedure that we just showed you versus a sham. And the sham is really important in studies because we all wonder what's the placebo effect of anything we do. And so what the sham was in this procedure was simply placing the specialized needle on the bone, but not introducing anything more and not ablating the nerve. What did that study show? It showed, as I mentioned, that 70% patients saw at least a 50% reduction in their pain. They continued to follow the treatment arm up to five years and saw even actual better outcomes at the five-year mark compared to the two-year mark. Which to me is weird. Why would you get more benefit at five years than two years? Totally agree. Yes. That was unexpected. I think we all, in general, when we follow studies long-term enough, you start to see an increase in pain over time. However, with this particular procedure, we actually saw the pain scores improve. And these studies are all industry sponsored. This is expensive stuff, multi-million dollar trials. You can't really fund it without, you know, private sector money. There's always bias, I think, when there's industry funded studies. Is there any stuff out there that's not industry funded that you think is pretty objective um, that, show that shows that this thing works? Yeah, that is the biggest criticism of all these major studies is that they're industry sponsored. So interestingly, there have been some international studies which have targeted the basal vertebral nerve using other techniques and have also shown good outcomes. So again, that reproducibility is really important for the entire field. 
And I do think, I mean, we always say anecdotals, anecdotals, not real data. You know, I, I see thousands of patients, you see thousands of patients. I see tons of patients with vertebrogenic pain that have back pain. And I do think, you know, seeing you do this over the last few years, people do get better. They are able to avoid surgery, which is great. We're always looking to something. We're always looking for something to help patients avoid surgery. And this, I think for the first time, is something we can offer our patients, you know, short of surgery for degenerative disease, vertebrogenic change. Let's talk about whenever we do an intervention as someone, if I do surgery, pay, as much as we try to explain the risks, benefits of recovery, patients always come back and they're like, you know, doc, like I really wish I knew this more or talked about that more. What are some things that patients come back to you about after the procedure, whether or not they had a good outcome or a bad outcome about the procedure, the recovery or what they expected? What are some three key points that patients always wish they knew beforehand? Well, the first thing is, it can take some time for the relief to set in. I learned this the hard way in my first five to 10 patients. I actually thought the procedure didn't work because they'd be coming back two weeks, six weeks, even three months later saying, I'm not sure this really helped me. However, those same individuals came back six months, 12 months later to tell me, you know what, I did get relief. So be patient. As far as why this is, we have lots of theories, um, primarily regarding how we process pain. From the first study that I was talking about, the SMART trial, the average length of time that people had pain was seven years. So we're talking about people who had pain a really, really long time. It takes some time to unwind that, even if you do take away the peripheral pain generator. And that, so the clinical outcome studies also show they didn't collect pain scores until three months after the intervention. That's right. They didn't collect them until that's three right. weeks. So right? that's the so, first time point is three okay. months. Um, so that's one thing. What else would you say? As we talked about with anesthesia, we generally do this without a tube. However, some patients, for reasons that the anesthesiologist determines, may end up getting a tube. And so that is something that afterwards people have told me, hey, I wasn't expecting that, but I It seems like a bigger procedure. If they're getting Correct. a tube, they're going to sleep, they got a breathing machine, et cetera. Correct. And is there any downside to that? No, other than occasionally people will get a sore throat. From the, from the, from tube. the tube, okay. And then last thing, would you say? Although most people see soreness for about a week, I've had some individuals say it took about two weeks for them to really recover from the procedure, but very rare. Okay. I mean, I think as I discussed in this video, we, this is not a sponsored video. I see lots of different interventions that come and go and they used to ablate the discs. There's all sorts of stuff, stem cells, etc. To me, this as a surgeon, I really like to see something that can treat somebody without surgery, using surgery as the last option. In terms of this degeneration, we really never had something with this much evidence, outcomes that are this good. Again, I don't think it works for everyone, That's right. but as you've seen in our practice, almost every patient where I would normally say, let's do the anesthetic discogram, now let's do the fusion, um, you know, I'm sending over to you to try this ablation. I don't think it's a, a bridge that gets burnt. So as an anesthesia pain doctor, you see lots of therapies come and go, different types of ablations, different types of uh, non-interventional spine procedures. Um, overall, how many relievants have you done so far in the last how many years? Over 220 patients over five years. And would you say um, this thing's here to stay? Would you say, Absolutely. How, how would you rank it in terms of the um, interventional things that you've seen come and go? Definitely top three, potentially number one. Uh, it's definitely here to stay. I think time will tell where it stands. So thanks Dr. Naidu for being back again and joining us on Spine Guy. Hopefully you guys learned a little bit about this new relievant procedure or basic vertebral ablation.